This conference will now be recorded. Yes. So welcome all of you. Welcome Dr. Gitika. So we'll be taking a free session on the management of third and fourth degree perennial tests. And um, uh, I know that this is a high time that revision of guidelines is very essential. And this is one of the very important guidelines. So Dr. Gitika will be highlighting all the key points and exam oriented uh, points. So you can go ahead and um, uh, attend address the session. Thank you. OK, thank you, Rashmi. So let us start with uh, the guideline. So the management of third and fourth degree perennial tears, uh, the important key points which the guideline has to say, just a second. So talking about the overall incidence of uh, perennial tears, obstetric anal sphincter injuries in UK, it ranges from zero to 8%. Uh, with the average range being 2.9%. Uh, the incidence is higher in primary gravida. Uh, it is 6.1% as compared to multi-para, which is 1.7%. So these are some of the very important numbers which you should be aware of. Overall incidence being 2.9, in primary it is 6.1, and in multi it is 1.7%. The classification of perennial tears, which has been given by Sultan, and this has been adopted by International Consultation on Incontinence. So normally the perennial tears, they are divided into four types of tears. First degree tears, second degree, third degree tears are further divided into three, and the fourth degree tears. First degree tear means injury to the perennial skin, or and the vaginal mucosa. So only the skin or the mucosa of the perineum is involved. Second degree tear, which includes our episiotomies also. This means that there is injury to the perineum involving the perineal muscles, but the sphincter is intact. There is no injury to the anal sphincter. Third degree tears are the injuries to the perineum, which involve the anal sphincter complex. They are further divided into 3A, 3B, and 3C, where 3A is when less than 50% of external anal sphincter is stoned. 3B is when more than 50% of external anal sphincter is stoned. And 3C is when both the external and the internal anal sphincters they are torn. So less than 50% is 3A, more than 50% is 3B. And if both external and internal anal sphincters, they are torn, it is 3C. Four degree tear is injury to the perineum, where along with anal sphincter, even the anorectal mucosa is involved. Involvement of mucosa, anorectal mucosa, gives a grade of fourth degree to the perineal tear. So these are the four types of perineal tear which we can encounter during a delivery. If there is any doubt about the degree of third degree tear, whether it is 3A, 3B, or 3C, the guideline says that it is always advisable that we grade it as a higher degree rather than the lower degree. So for example, if you're not sure whether uh, less than 50% or 50% or more than 50% of external and sphincter is torn. The guideline says that it is always a good idea that we give it a higher grade degree tier as compared to giving it a lower degree. Now, third degree and fourth degree perineal tiers are the tiers which uh, comprises uh, obstructive anal sphincter injury. So first and second degree tears, they are not uh, obstetric anal sphincter injuries. It is the third and the fourth year because we all know that it is the anal sphincters which are involved in third degree and the mucosa is involved along with anal sphincter in the fourth degree. Anal incontinence is defined as a complaint of involuntary loss of flatus or feces, which affects our quality of life. There is another kind of tear which is not classified in this uh, Sultan classification. This is rectal button, button hole tear. So if the tear involves the rectal mucosa with intact anorectal sphincter, it is by definition not a fourth degree tear because the anal sphincter complex is intact. 
So only there is a communication between the vaginal mucosa and the rectal mucosa, but the sphincter is uh, intact. This is given a separate uh, entity, separate name that is rectal button hole tear. It is very important that you recognize and repair this tear because failure to do so will lead to uh, rectovaginal fistula. There are some predictory uh, factors and uh, how can we predict? There are some risk factors for obstetric anal sphincter injuries. The first one being Asian ethnicity. Asians are more likely to have uh, OSS and the odds ratio is 2.27. Nunley Paris women, the relative risk of having obstetric anal sphincter injury is 6.97. Birth weight of the baby greater than 4 kg. Here, the odds ratio is 2.27. It is same as that of Asian ethnicity. Shoulder dystocia, the uh, odds ratio is 1.9. Occipital posterior position, the relative risk becomes 2.44. So it is higher as compared to uh, your others, Asian ethnicity or birth weight more than 4 kgs or shoulder dystocia. But definitely, nulli parity is the first uh, uh, where the relative risk, risk is uh, very high as compared to multiparous women. Prolonged second stage of labor. If the duration is between two to three hours, relative risk is 1.47. If the duration is three to four hours, relative risk is 1.79. And if it is more than four hours, then the relative risk is 2.02. .02. Instrumental delivery. This is very important. When to delivery without episiotomy, the, relative, the odds ratio of anal sphincter injury is 1.89. Ventus delivery with episiotomy, the odds ratio is less. It is 0.5. Forceps delivery without episiotomy, the odds ratio is 6.5. It is again very high, though it is less as compared to the Nulli Paris. Forceps delivery with episiotomy, the odds ratio is 1.34. Risk factor for sustaining recurrent obstetrics and a sphincter injury in subsequent pregnancies include Asian ethnicity, forceps delivery, and birth weight more than 4 kg. So these are the risk factors for sustaining obstetric and a sphincter injury in any subsequent pregnancy. If the female is of Asian ethnicity, if she is going to have a forceps delivery, and if the estimated birth weight of the baby is more than 4 kg, then there are chances that she can have recurrent obstetric anal sphincter injury. So these three are the factors which are responsible. Can obstetric anal sphincter injuries be prevented? The clinician should explain to the woman that the evidence for protective effect of episiotomy is conflicting. This is very important. Any prophylactic episiotomy is, may, is not always going to pre prevent your obstetric anal sphincter injury. But yes, when if the patient already had obstetric anal sphincter injury and her subsequent delivery is by instruments, then definitely a mediolateral episiotomy should be considered. But otherwise, if it is a non-instrumental vaginal delivery, then uh, the role of episiotomy is conflicting. Whenever we are giving episiotomy, this is very, very important that the angles should be 60 degree away from the midline when the perineum is distended. We can use special scissors have been design, designed to ensure that the, ang that the incision angle is 60 degree. Perineal protection at the time of crowning can also be protective and this is grade three recommendation, grade C recommendation. Even the warm compression, uh, they say they are very effective during second stage and they carry recommend, recommendation A grade. So warm compression, if they give you all, all of the uh, following preventive measures and one of them is warm compression, so always go with warm compression because it carries a recommendation grade A. Warm compression during second stage of labor. It reduces the risk of oasis. 
perineal protection the nice intrapartum care guideline found that there was no difference between hand poised and hands on technique preventing the pre, uh, for the prevention of oasis however more recently there have been intervention studies using programs which have successfully reduced obstetric anal sphincter injuries rate so the hands on technique definitely the recent studies show that it does prevent against oasis what do you mean by hands on technique it means that the left hand slows down the delivery of the head the left hand is slowing down the delivery the right hand is giving the protection to the perineum we ask the mother not to push when the head is crowning and we think about the episiotomy depending upon the risk factors and whenever we are giving episiotomy we ensure that the angle is 60 degree to the midline bridging maneuver there there is one another maneuver which was studied in various uh, literature in various uh, study groups they have uh, studied this maneuver and the technique you, you they used was they delivered the fetal head using one hand to pull the fetal chain from between the maternal anus and the coccyx and the other hand was on the fetal occiput to control the speed of the delivery so instead of keeping the hand on the perineum with though the one hand was on the occiput with the other hand they pulled the fetal chain from between the maternal anus and the coccyx but the studies have shown that the ritchen maneuver is no better than the standard hands on technique so it has the same uh, uh, outcome perineal massage during the antenatal period and in the second stage of labor has been suggested as a possible way of ena enabling the perineal tissue to expand more easily during the birth so this is yes also one of the preventive measures where from 36 weeks onwards the patient and her uh, partner is told for uh, the perineal massages so their hair uh, the thumb is introduced inside the vagina and in a u shaped manner the perineum and the lower vagina is massaged so the studies show that this expands and uh, relaxes the muscles and it makes the birth more easier how do we identify obstetric anal sphincter injuries all the women who have vaginal birth they are at a risk of obstetric anal sphincter injury or isolated rectal buttle hole tears they should therefore be examined systematically including a digital rectal examination which is very important to assess the severity of the damage particularly prior to suturing so always ensure that a per rectal examination is done before suturing and even after suturing to make sure that none of the sutures has been inadvertently taken through the rectal mucosa so it's very important step according to nice perineal care guidance guidance before assessing for genital trauma healthcare professional should explain to the women what they plan to do and why they should of the patient should be offered inhalation analgesia there should be good lightning and uh, the position of the women uh, should be so that she is comfortable and so that the genital structures can be easily seen so normally a lithotomy position is given the examination should be performed gently and should be done immediately in the immediate period following birth if genital trauma is identified following birth further systematic assessment should be carried out including a rectal examination this i have already told you systematic uh, assessment of the genital trauma should include further explanation of what the healthcare professional plans to do and why confirmation by the women that effective local or regional analgesia is in place visual assessment of extent of perineal trauma to include the structures involved the, ap the apex of the injury and the assessment of bleeding and the rectal examination to assess whether there have been any damage to external or internal anal sphincter 
Following a vaginal delivery, anal sphincter and anorectal mucosa injury cannot be excluded without performing a rectal examination. Since introduction of endoanal ultrasound, sonographic abnormality of anal sphincter, that is occult injury, was identified in 33% of the women following vaginal delivery. However, when endoanal ultrasound was performed immediately following delivery, the detection rate of the sphincter injury was not significantly, did not significantly increase compared with the clinical examination alone. So clinical examination is as good as performing an ultrasound. As there are certain limitations in availability, image quality, interpretation skills, and patient acceptability, the use of endoanal ultrasound in detecting anal sphincter injury immediately after delivery should be viewed only as a research tool. How do you repair? What are the journal principles now? Repair of third and fourth degree tear should be conducted by an appropriately trained clinician or by a trainee under supervision. This should be done in an operation theater under regional or journal anesthesia with good lightning and appropriate instruments. If there is excessive bleeding, you can insert a vaginal pad and the women should be taken to the theater as soon as possible. Figure of eight suture should be avoided. You are not going to give figure of eight suture while repairing the anal sphincters or mucosa because they are hemostatic in nature and they can cause tissue ischemia. And we really don't want that. So we are never giving figure of eight suture. Rectal examination, as I told you earlier, should always be performed before and after the repair to ensure the sutures have not been inserted through the mucosa. If suture is identified, it should be removed. Which technique should be used to accomplish the repair of the anorectal mucosa? The tone anorectal mucosa should be repaired with sutures using either continuous or interrupted technique. When obstetric anal sphincter repairs are being performed, the burring of the surgical knot, very important, should be beneath the superficial perineal muscles so as to minimize the risk of knot or suture migration to the skin. These are the sutures and this is the method of repair depending upon the structure which is torn. So if the anorectal mucosa is torn, if the mucosa, how, how will you repair the mucosa? Mucosa, you need a very delicate suture to repair. So a braided vicryl 3-0, 3-0 is very thin. So vicryl or polyglactin, uh, vicryl also known as polyglactin suture is used. So 3-0 suture is used, 3-0 polyglactin suture is used to repair the anorectal mucosa and you can use continuous technique or interrupted technique. Now, if the internal anal sphincter is torn, what to do? Again, you are going to repair using an interrupted or mattress sutures, but these, the fibers of internal anal sphincter should never be overlapped. This is very important without any attempt to overlap. You are not overlapping the internal anus sphincters. The suture which is used, you can use a bit thicker of vicryl, that is 2-0 polyglactin now, or you can use a monofilament. Polyglactin is multifilament suture. It is vicryl. It is modern braided suture. Or you can use 3-0 PDS suture. So either 3-0 PDS, or 2-0 polyglactin can be used. This is with regards to internal anal sphincter. If a full thickness external anal sphincter is torn, if a full thickness external anal sphincter is torn, then either you can, you, the method you have to use is the interrupted or mattress sutures. 
this is the method of repair and you can use an end to end technique or you can even overlap because external anchor external anus sphincter if at if it is fully toned you can even overlap it suture again is the same 30 pds monofilament or modern braided sutures that is such as 20 polyclactic this is a full thickness external anus sphincter the sutures for all of them are same internal anal external anal they are the same only for mucosa it is a bit thinner suture and that to modern braided you are not using pds on mucosa remember always 30 polyglactin you are using if it is a partial uh, uh, tear of external anal sphincter injury then again you are not going for overlap you are going for end to end technique only as you were doing for internal anus sphincter and the filaments and the sutures again they are the same that is 20 polyglactin modern braided or 30 pds monofilament they are the same for all these post operate operative management is also very very important in obstetric anus sphincter injuries so the use of broad spectrum antibiotic is recommended following repair of obstetric anus sphincter injury to reduce the risk of post operative infection and wound dehiscence the use of post operative laxative is recommended to reduce the risk of wound dehiscence bulking agent should not be given routinely this is very important point though you are giving laxatives but you are routinely not giving bulking agents physiotherapy is very important so the women should be advised that physiotherapy following the repair of oasis is beneficial and a follow up appointment at 6 to 12 weeks postpartum should be scheduled for her and this should be by a clinician who has special interest in sphincter injuries or by the consultant if at the time of follow up women is still experiencing incontinence or pain the referral should be to a specialist gynecologist or colorectal surgeon it, and it should be considered this is very important so if at 6 to 12 weeks follow up period your patient is symptomatic you are going to refer this patient to a specialist gynecologist or colorectal surgeon who will be doing the endoanal pressure studies for the patient but the guideline says that 60 to 80% of the women they become asymptomatic by the end of 12 months or one year following delivery so this number is very very important 60 to 80% of the women they are asymptomatic future deliveries yes regarding future deliveries also all the women who have sustained sphincter injuries in the previous pregnancy should be counseled about the mode of delivery and this should be clearly documented in her notes the role of prophylactic episiotomy is not known this i have told earlier and therefore an episiotomy should only be performed if clinically indicated all the women who have sustained sphincter injury in the previous pregnancies and those who are symptomatic or they have abnormal endoanal ultrasound or manometry the pressure studies are abnormal the ultrasound is abnormal or she is symptomatic they should be counseled for elective cesarean section in subsequent pregnancy the risk of sustaining a further third and fourth degree tear after a subsequent in uh, in any further deliveries it is 5 to 7% this number is very very important the risk of subsequent vaginal delivery after a third degree tear has been assessed with 17% of the women developing worsening fecal symptoms after the second vaginal delivery so 17% of the women they have worsening of their symptoms this seem to occur if there has been if there had been fecal incontinence beyond 3 months but resolution by 6 months so if the women had 
fecal incontinence even after between three to four, five, six months, then there is 17% chance that her fecal symptoms may get worsened after the second delivery. Though this number is not that important, but yes, the risk of sustaining a further third and four degree tear is five to seven percent. This number is very important. Whenever there is obstetric anal sphincter injury, the risk management steps should also be looked for and they are very important. So all the units should have a clear protocol for managing obstetric anal sphincter injury. Documentation of anatomical structures involved, the method of repair and suture material should be made. Ideally, a diagrammatic uh, representation should be done in her notes. The woman should be fully informed about the nature of her tear and the offer of follow-up should be made. And all should be uh, given, uh, the written information should be provided to her. There has been rise in litigation related to OASIS. The majority of the cases are related to failure to identify the injury. It is not the injury which has led to a litigation. It is fairly a common complication after vaginal delivery, but failure to recognize sphincter injury has led to most of the litigation because subsequent, subsequently, if you fail to recognize the sphincter injury, this can lead to anal incontinence and fistulas. Clear documentation, preferably using a drawing Together with providing the women with an explanation and patient information leaflet is therefore very important in this case. So these were some of the key points regarding, uh, regarding this guideline. I have few questions in case you want to perform. Manikam and Bismil, are you interested in, in uh, solving the answers, dears? Yes, ma'am. For, yeah. for patients with third and fourth degree perineal tear, how many remain asymptomatic at 12 months after OASIS? Uh, that is 60 to 80 percent, ma'am. 60 to 80 percent. Yes, very good. Second and one. A 34 year old patient sustains 3B perineal tear following delivery of her third child. What is the UK incidence of OASIS in multiparous women? It is uh, 1.7, ma'am. 1.7 percent. Yeah, for uh, Nali it is 6.1, and for Multi it is 1.7, and overall it is 2.9. Yes, ma'am. Which of these is not true about management of obstetric anal sphincter injury in the post-op period? The ma'am, the bulking agents should be used with laxatives. That is not true, yeah, ma'am. So ideally, yeah, ideally, the bulking agent routinely should not be prescribed together with the laxatives. Correct. But definitely broad spectrum antibiotics, post op laxatives physiotherapy and a review at six to 12 weeks is definitely recommended. Okay. Next one, patient had normal delivery, had multiple tears. Paraurethral labial and tear involving 50% of external anal sphincter, but intact mucosa and internal anal sphincter. So how will you grade this tear? This would be the 3B third degree, ma'am. Yes. So less than 50 involved. degree, yeah. Yes. Right. Less than 50 degree, we grade it as 3A. Mm. More than 50 degree, we grade it as 3B. So 50%, mm. yes, always we give a higher grade. So 3B will be the answer. Uh, so for the following scenarios, select the most appropriate suture. A monofilament uh, used to repair the external anal sphincter. That is a 3-0 PDS, ma'am. PDS. So monofilament mm. is PDS. Right. Yes. Repairing and of anorectal mucosa? There is a 3-0 polyglactin. 
polyglactin yes very yeah. correct yeah. a modern and braided modern... braided element used to repair the internal anal sphincter so the 20 polyglactin ma'am yes correct Which of the following risk factors has the strongest association with the obstetric sphincter injury? Ethnicity, occipital posterior position, prolonged second stage shoulder dystocia, or ventos delivery with episiotomy. Yes. Occipital posterior position, ma'am. Yes. I'm not sure. So remember this chart. Yeah, this chart mm. is important. So though mm. the maximum association is with nulli parity, just a minute here. So the though the maximum, but this was not given in uh, one in the option. So they gave okay. you the ethnicity, sh the shoulder dystocia, and occipital posterior position, and mentos delivery with episiotomy. So occipital posterior, the relative risk is two point four four. So this one mm. is the highest. Okay. okay. Okay, good. So these were some of the key points in the guideline. I hope mm. it was helpful to you. We do have some courses coming up. Um, one is the marathon course, which is for ten days duration, and where where we will be revising all the GTGs, nice guideline for uh, the talk articles and other important topics will be covered. So in case any one of you wants to join it, you can inquire on this number. and there is a regular course also which is coming up sorry there is a regular course or course also which is coming up it is of 3 months duration again you can just drop in the message at the given number and it includes all the gtgs nice guidelines talk articles there will be question pools free mock test and telegram support will be available and all the recordings will be available so these are the two upcoming uh, courses which we are having So Rashmi, I hope you are there. If you want to add something? Ah uh, yes, Kritika. So the other courses. So do join and uh, get a good performance, and we'll be there to mentor you and guide you through the exams. So thank you so much for a wonderful session. It was so useful, and all the highlighted uh, points and all they were all SPS and EMQs, which are very important. Thank you so much, dear. Thank you. Thank you. all the best take care i'm ending the session and the recording will uh, be given to you okay okay you, good night take care good night take care